I want to take you back to something that you've mentioned at least twice in our conversation, which is move the chairs, get out of the way hmm. of good people, right? So, what does that really mean when you say get out of the way? How does that translate into what you do as a leader? Hmm. Trust that one is uh, trust them to solve the problem, but before that, there is one crucial step, right? Which is have they understood one the significance of what we are actually trying to solve? Are they acknowledging the problem current state as it is, or are we in denial? And as long as we are actually on the same page with respect, see, ultimately in no, any sorry, com- I'm, I'm still going yeah. to ask, what does get out of the way mean? <laughs> get out of the way means because it's trust them to yeah. solve the problem, right? And then you, but why are then you, you in check the way? in, right? So, why are you in the way? So delegation without review is abdication, right? So you delegate, you trust them to solve the problem, but you, if you are responsible, and ultimately if you are still responsible for that area, then you still have to check in with them for progress and hold them. Uh, have that conversation to ensure that it's actually progressing the way you would like, right? So that is general working style. And within that, uh, to be able to do this, get out of the way, what is one more important step that is there is to ensure that they have understood we are on the same page with respect to the problem definition, this current state of things that we are asking them to fix. Or okay, what can, I, can I flip this question? Sure. What does being in the way look like? Uh, being in the way you look like you you since you're a, saying uh, yeah, that yeah, getting yeah, out of the way yeah, yeah so you give the problem to them right and then you continue to obsess about it for me right being in the way would mean I say when I work on entitlements so here is what you need to do and then instead of actually trusting this person just agreeing on some contracts to say hey just make sure that you talk to these these types of people and build enough context come back to me with your learnings and then do xyz things and then just run with it i keep doing most of the user study and then go and tell him what to, micromanaging to some like yeah micromanaging is over simplified word but basically even simple things like telling him insights instead of trusting his learnings from customers i still continue to trust my hunch more than the information that he is actually gathering firsthand. We live in times when entrepreneurship has been elevated to a fine performance art or even a cult. The formulaic stories of entrepreneurial success we consume each day are slick, bulleted and cleaned up to remove all needless references to false starts, serendipity or accidents. And at the center of those stories sit founders, visionary leaders who dream up startups worth billions of dollars out of nothing, like Krish Subramanian, the co-founder and CEO of Chargebee, an Indian company that started out as a maker of software to help businesses manage their paying subscribers and subscriptions. Chargebee now operates in the broader and larger market of revenue management, and it was last valued at over $3.5 billion. But Krish's own path to success was anything but formulaic. He graduated in 2001 as the dot-com boom was cratering and the world was spooked by the 911 attacks on New York. He couldn't find a job. Six months later, when he finally did, his first salary was a measly 3,500 rupees. It would be another 10 years before he finally got together with his co-founders and started Chargebee. Their first idea was to build an on-demand professional services company like urban companies today, but that didn't work. So they picked the space of subscription payments. Even then, Chris says they spent the first five years, quote, going around in circles, unquote, before finally hitting their groove. In today's episode, he reflects and explains the meandering path that he and Chargebee took to success and the lessons he learned along the way. For instance, why it's important for early stage founders to set constraints and say no instead of challenge accepted, learning to let go of the need for world-changing ideas, hiring for strengths, and why someone who's great for a zero to one project may be terrible for a one to 10 or 10 to 100 project. Treating business as a game and not getting attached to your preconceived definitions of success how North Star goals can bring an entire organization together and create true inflection points. And the most important role for a CEO, trusting others, getting out of the way and letting go. Or 
in Krish's own words, continuously firing yourself. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Thank you, Krish, for coming on the show. I'll begin with a very blunt question. In one line, what is charge B? Okay. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, it's been a while, like, I think, <laughs> what, six 11? months? Or like, since I first reached out to you, what is it, more than that? Uh, no, less than, probably less than six months. Ah, right. But, but anyway, yeah. sorry, uh, <laughs> I, I interrupted you. Yeah, charge B is now revenue growth management for subscription businesses. That's a new tagline, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, that's a mouthful. Could you repeat that? Charge B is revenue growth management platform for subscription businesses. Revenue growth management platform for subscription businesses. I'll start with the part which I know. For subscription businesses. Yes. By that you mean all sorts of businesses that build their subscribers on some kind of a recurring basis. That is Could correct. Could be a TV channel, magazine... Uh, uh, Apple Music, etc. I mean, I'm not using those literal examples for you. That is but correct. Almost every type of business now wants some form of recurring revenue from customers. And there are so many variations of how you would collect money from customers, right? All the way from a fixed monthly fees to, you know, B2B model from fixed seats to selling multiple products, more licenses and so on and so forth. There are so many variations, metered, usage-based billing models and annual monthly contracts, Right. And a hybrid models and all of that. But ultimately, all of this has one thing that is in the middle, which is you optimize for customer lifetime value. Just the way even Ken now does, like started with one product, one story a day to podcast and all ways in which you now own the audience. While you actually build that freemium user base through multiple products, and having select products that you sell independently and then the bundle of products that you sell together and all of that, every single exploration in the journey is about thinking about what does my customer want and what do I produce that is a value to them, that there is this um, transaction where, okay, I deliver value and I capture value and that needs to be fair, right? The, the customer is at the middle. Those and variations is what we call as subscription businesses. If somebody wants to switch from monthly to annual or annual to monthly, what are you supposed to do? How do you prorate the charges? Now, every one of these little features that you think about, one by one adds to more and more capabilities that you need to add. Like you have all the customers in India, great, right? You can launch in Indian rupees. The moment you want, like you have friends who actually want to purchase from US dollar, the purchasing parity is different. Initially, you will say, yeah, keep paying in INR. And I will absorb the conversion cost of the currency and all of that, which is fine. But you know that now suddenly 20% of your customer base is from US and Europe. You realize maybe if I, can I actually start pricing this in another currency based on purchasing parity? Will I actually have an uplift in revenue? Because they may not blink for at so least for new subscribers. People who can pay more Correct. from right. a different Based country. on the price elasticity, you want to actually test it. Then, But while doing it, you also want to treat your early customers right. right? So you want to grandfather prices to them and say, okay, I'm going to honor the existing contract by keeping your old prices the same way while I launch any new iteration, it's only for new subscribers. How do you implement that logic? Again, on the website, you can actually just change it, but operationalizing it is generally a product ops or a marketing ops. And basically it everything comes together today as a, a more sophisticated function called revenue ops, which needs to tie what goes into marketing website, what goes into the product and what goes into your customer data Right. Today, customer ops has become central to mining the potential of your customers, as well as knowing your best customers. Like if you have 1,000 customers, who are your best 100 who get the most value, who reads your stories every day? Then how do I get my next 10,000 to be similar to this 100 or what behaviors? Like everything that is at the intersection of product and customers and revenue goes into the whole revenue ops. So do you make money? How do you make money? Do they purchase your software? Is it is it a function since your revenue management? Do customers pay you as a function of the revenue that you drive? Um, so it's 
in some ways indexed around the size of our customers because the complexity of any implementation and the sophistication of capabilities they want is a function of mostly the revenue size in some ways it's a proxy but they pay us a subscription fees for the platform all right so you are you help customers handle subscriptions and you yourself are of course are like a subscription, subscription business of course like there's certain and all the variations that. around it like base platform fees plus overages and all of that to have the joint uh, win win how old is charge b uh since we started uh, now it's going to be 12 years we bootstrap first <laughs> how many employees do you have uh about 1000 people just over 1000 and um what's your revenue um now we don't talk about revenue okay. all right <laughs> revenue. um how much venture capital have you raised till date okay um about 470 million in capital um most recent was uh, jan 2021 um and that was a 250 million dollar round uh, that's a large yeah. round yes so i do know that the pandemic supercharged a lot of like you know companies and your company was one of the what were you last valued at uh the last valuation was about 3 and a half billion dollars you're based out of amsterdam that's correct why <laughs> um All the and, founders. And by that I mean, like, yeah. it's not a common base for founders. I mean, in, yeah. in the sense that, right? So why why Amsterdam? Uh, I find the time zone okay. So it came down to two choices. One is, like, uh, uh, all founders are in Chennai, right? And our leadership team, a lot of CXOs were hired in US because of like uh, the talent access and all of that. Um, So sorry, you hired a lot of people in the US because that's where the talent was, not necessarily where the market was. No, our customer base is primarily fifty-one percent is North America and forty-five percent is Europe. So we do Got have it. customers. Yeah. Most of our customers are US and North America and Europe. But for the majority of a general high-growth company, most of the time, like if I were to do the early, let's say the one to ten or one to fifty journey again. i would actually avoid a lot of mistakes right we jokingly say that we have built a beautiful probably 7 year old company in 12 7 or 8 year old company in 12 years right because you wish you could actually claw back some of the time not making some could, of the stupid you, mistakes uh, could you could you <laughs> go deeper into that what does it mean like you know what mistakes uh, uh, you would avoid right uh, all the way starting from the way we actually build the company right like four software engineers starting a company and then uh very naive uh, mistakes like um taking one and a half years to actually build a much broader value proposition than a sharper value proposition so you take your sweet one and a half years time before you even start onboarding customers because you want to launch perfectly it seems really stupid knowing the common before wisdom. the conversation started you were asking me uh, <laughs> about my first startup and one of the points that i wanted to tell you was that i think the one of the mistakes that first time founders make is over perfection Yes, and trying to create a product or a company which will address a lot of things and yes. capture the world, and while also being so, you're very broad, and right. you're just you want to do pixel perfect design, and you're like, I will launch it, and then the world will be yeah. the path to my door. Correct, right? And a particular engineer's mindset, un- unfortunately, also works against you, which is everything looks like a challenge that you want to take on through code, and then you say, okay. i want to build all the sophistication in a way that even schools and universities when they actually everything pay you modular, everything, everything is modular everything is modular everything is actually that is also subscription so why don't i actually build it in a way that i can also serve that customer market and then there is always like unfortunately like even though you get fortunately you get inbound but unfortunately you also get inbound the reason is when somebody is knocking at your doorstep saying okay i have a music subscription business and uh, i teach students and this is like a small music school with like 100 200 people that i want to charge annually but i want to collect this fees monthly can your product do it challenge accepted right and that's a problem because we come from a api first background like very product centric engineers and that is the strength and all of that and yet you build a product for a customers first customer base who is actually trying to not use any of your api capability but is going to expect everything to be solved through the user interface and yet you accept that as a challenge thinking let me build the api capability as a api first product thinking actually you are able to think about a developer requirement first and yet when you talk to a potential customer you don't realize that 
that was not the persona i actually thought about why am i trying to suddenly jump to a different challenge and yet we yes. built for e-commerce and everybody to actually be able to use a product it's also important to be i mean with the benefit of hindsight i'm sure you know that that you need to be able to say no yes and you need to be able to say no we are not building for you and that feels somewhat wrong when you're a first time early stage founder Correct. because you're like here yeah, is a it's customer it's not a challenge to be accepted right and there is no ego hurt uh, to actually walk away from certain segments it's just clarity about and conviction to say like the this the like the slow is smooth smooth is fast kind of situation right where you say okay i can only serve fewer customers now accepting your limitations as a business as a number of people with a small company to say i'm more likely to be able to delight a small group of people rather than actually trying to please a wide range of customers i think that somehow we don't internalize it well enough and talk about it well enough internally amongst founders that we end up creating making it harder for each other the person who is actually trying to be gtm like uh, i'm a software engineer but i put my hand up to say i'll figure out everything else you guys focus on building the product and i didn't want to let them down i just wanted to bring every customer possible so to <laughs> does this does this extend to the way we look at talent as well in the early stage because when you're building a startup in the early stage one of the things that you don't have the luxury of is deciding who you, sometimes it's like the talent that you attract and the talent right okay. and you get a lot of talented ambitious people who may be generalists who are not and and it's it's the same yeah, does that play out where you're on i think you my hypothesis is this is also the reason why some of the indian companies when we actually start up we are slightly bigger than not slightly like reasonably bigger than most us counterparts and uh, some companies are are able to build with 10 15 people the amount of progress they are able to make versus the 50 people 60 people team that we have to actually get to even a million dollars i think some the, of that is a symptom of uh, one the choices we make right in the early ecosystem and then um, and the access to that talent or not maybe in some ways not having a strong point of view about who do i actually want right clarity about how to hire before we get into you know your early 5 f- years you passed out in 2001 which was like you know for a lot of people who are thinking that these are the worst of times it was one <laughs> of the worst years uh yeah, after to be september grad- 9 it, it became worse after september 11 exactly right <laughs> like you know i i i passed out of my uh, post grad in 2001 so i remember it quite well job offers were being withdrawn companies were like slashing or like laying off people yeah. it was really hard time yeah. and june 2011 get... may june 2011 when we graduated was actually worse 2001 yeah. yeah sorry it was yeah 2001 yeah, yeah. and then by september 2001 right it was like okay the world is falling apart right that's right <laughs> dot com crash followed by 911 <laughs> and you didn't land a job and like you were looking for yeah. a job and like what happened again like you know it's you you graduated into a time of adversity hmm. what happened then okay how did charge we come about what was the path <laughs> that happened from graduating and finding that there are no jobs to understand like yeah, 10 years later starting yeah. charge we right um so i picked software engineering because i really love computer science engineering and uh, from very early on i got hooked to computers and um uh so i did not want to take the obvious path which my a lot of my friends had to default to which was like bpos and other jobs i was like you know i really want to actually try and figure out if i can land as a developer right that is one but i what i did not know was the like how to apply the skills acquired in college to okay making money right either through salary or like actually making software and being able to sell i had no idea um but i kept while looking for jobs i was working as a trainer in um in one of those places in the computer science institute like uh, in a part time and all of that stuff while trying to look for a job because i didn't want to ask parents for money but even though in india we tend to live uh, with our parents um so that happened and uh, i was little for 6 months i was actually doing all these kind of things looking for a job it was serendipitous uh, meeting with uh, somebody who actually lives very close by here uh, there is a company called matrixnet in bangalore and the founder happened to come to chennai to meet his relative and then i happened to be at home 
and he said why don't you just come over i'll give you like we'll figure out something and uh, he asked me to come over and he was building this one of the first online auction engines here matixnet and he offered me a, a job and he thought like i didn't ask for salary any of that but anyways my first salary was 3507 rupees but i didn't even like he thought i'll join after a month and but uh, it was i think thursday or friday he said okay do you want to come and join me i said yes and then okay monday morning i'll come and meet you and <laughs> and then i just packed and then just came to bangalore and then uh, stayed uh, working so interestingly first was uh, an opportunity to work with the founder ceo who um i worked on the online auction engine data cleansing and then setting up the builds and then changing that engine a little bit and all of that just one or two weeks I realized that um, he realized that we could do a lot more because there were two three of us engineers and what i brought to the table he was able to imagine that he knew a problem which is bharat electronics and others had a lot of excess inventory that they would sell directly but most of the time the cartels used to bid for it and take it locally and they couldn't even get a fair price by knowing what they could get globally and e governance was a buzzword so we used to actually go to bharat electronics because we were doing the online auction for them but we saw an opportunity that why are they selling all reams and reams of not selling but distributing reams and reams of paper tender documents uh, to people and all these vendor contractors just to bid they had to travel 2 3 hours every day like to every week once a week collect the tender submit the so tender this was your, we built a software for that this was your first job that was my first job and then i think you went to tcs that is correct so and this gave a window into i got infected with the idea of okay you see a problem you can actually a first time i saw the magic of we sold a sub 5 lakh rupees sell like software and we also collected hosted fees for that this is the precursor to saas the asp model right so we did that for me i got infected with this idea that okay like it's is possible that like a kid straight out of college with those level of skills i'm able to convert that into a software and we are able to make lakhs of rupees in money was a, a light bulb moment and then we did it uh, we did for a year but i don't know why i actually switched but the the pull of the brand and all of that like i wanted mentors and software and i ended up at tcs and i got lucky with implementing ariba suite of products at tcs it was a hp tcs hp joint venture and that was my uh, tcs seven and a half years i used to specialize in implementing ariba suite of products in procurement side for large enterprises but yeah, all I through this journey spend some time with cognizant as well a uh, year and a half with cognizant again on the pricing product uh, implementation but um, mm, that was not a uh, well planned uh, change yeah, for me that, I, yeah, I, yeah i think a lot of these are serendipitous <laughs> serendipitous the interesting part for me is that after these stints like after tcs after cognizant you quit your job wanting to start up correct so in 2009 i moved back to india because i did not want raman rajaraman raman, from the founder to yeah i was yeah. in us three and a half years and i was supposed to come i came here for a visa renewal and um, i had left the car house and all of that in us uh, rented like pretty much like house and all of that and then uh, i left my car and uh, i had traveled back for 2 3 weeks just to get the visa renewed and then i was supposed to go back for another 4 3 or 4 years uh, but uh, raman my co-founder and i had been talking about we were classmates from engineering days and we had been talking about starting a company from the very early stages of our career because um, Uh, early inspirations one he got the we did the campus interview invitation and all of that like we brought zoho at that time called advanet to our campus um and he was one of those three people who got placed at advanet and he had been talking about how they were operating as a company and why we should try and build a company like that and all of that and we were also fans of hacker news uh, news.ycombinator.com um which came i think slightly later but we used to follow joel spolsky's joel on software.com from the early 2000s um got exposed to this idea of uh, how a- just, just interrupting here to point out that this dream of wanting to start out with a classmate has been festering from the at this point for about a decade yes right from the right? beginning because and, uh, sometimes people don't understand that some people get to start up very soon after college correct. and for some people Yeah. it it continues to bubble yeah. for a it while it is a dream that we just kept alive 
thankfully just reading looking for inspirations everywhere and all of so, that like so what tip the you came back to india for your visa renewal and what changed then and for me my fear at that time was i think i lo- i make a lot of these kind of instinctive decisions this is how i am um for me i it felt like something is changing in the market and this guy is likely to start like we will start a company but if i actually go back with a visa to us that one is one is it's a l1 visa that wouldn't allow me to transfer or do anything on my own and i didn't want him to start without me and i otherwise i wouldn't have like who do i start with if that guy ends up starting without me so i said okay i'm going to actually then make a change stay here convince my wife that okay we let's stay here i was married 6 months to the marriage and I decided to just stay ask my friends to just sell off the car or whatever i had in the apartment and then just close the lease rent by closing the contract pay them off and i just decided to stay back but i still did not have a plan of when to start he had it took 2 years actually to eventually start right so we had not even talked about when we are starting but i just decided that i didn't want to put myself in a situation where i eliminate myself that's it right what does that mean meaning i could see that sas was beginning to happen and if we are going to start a company it felt like the time is now to start and if i go get stuck in a place committing to a job that doesn't allow me to if i go into some kind of a long term commitment in my job then if he's starting at that time uh, then i won't give myself the permission to be able to start right either you have to break your existing contract to come out like when i say contract is a commitment to build something for somebody and then and then so, what happened so you the, the two of you decided to start up what did you start up with so we kept talking right uh, actually uh, like your company the own static um our first idea was somewhat in the similar lines of urban clap the only thing we could actually so the weekends we started trying to write what is called as a business plan right we thought okay the idea has to be unique even though after reading so much over from hacker news joel spolsky blog base camp third zone signals and all of those things and still we fell into the trap thinking we are supposed to come up with an original idea and then we tried writing some ideas and all of that and then so i mean you said we fell into the trap of thinking that we should come up with an original, original idea. idea why do you call it a trap uh, because we we give ours we give a disproportionate amount of credit to the uniqueness of idea thinking that is what makes a company successful but it's probably not even 1% of eventual success of any company right it comes down to execution and persistence uh which is 99% of the effort um and we wrote urban club idea i think right before even urban club existed but that was one of the ideas for we felt like okay we feel the pain so we should probably solve the problem and the only thing we could actually see was instead of the number of reasons why this will succeed or like how to make it operational we could write, we wrote we wrote like a bunch of points and a couple of pages but the number of pages of what we wrote as blocks road blocks to be removed including collecting money how do you orchestrate a service infrastructure trust deficit in the society and all of that we could only see how why it will not work and then we realized okay this b2c thing is not for us and then we realized okay our strength has always been thankfully he had built products mostly so, focusing on global while you're doing all of this you're still not formed a company no. you're not earning a salary so you're living off your savings no 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 we were working like well because we were working at tcs i was working at oh, tcs and okay. cognizant mm. in the weekends we used to just try and write a business plan thinking maybe we'll come up with this unique idea before we actually quit and then we realized that that's very naive but thankfully um we saw that fresh desk had started then right and then um so they were friends raman and uh, they were friends uh, because of soho connection and that's when we i think some light bulb <laughs> moment happened for us to realize that okay go back to your strengths which is b2b right and serving global customers and there is actually a playbook for how to actually build these kind of companies why don't we just think about that through that lens there was two years you saying i mean you said roughly that, two years uh, you yeah spent. between that 2009 when i moved back to eventually starting when fresh desk started it was in mid 2010 or late 2010 and uh, raman had to also decide um thinking whether to join fresh desk because they were asking him right or to start his own company or stay at zoho and um, i was keen on starting up because i ever had moved back and uh, we made the and when we he asked me saying hey these are the choices and 
are we going to start up i was like of course we are starting up and then i just incorporated a company immediately <laughs> and, what was it called and oh, what did you want to do that's an embarrassing name like it was called bubble path p a t h okay. dot com without worrying about the product because our see one thing that co- normally defines us is the some level of silliness we even now we talk about it it's important that you don't take yourself too seriously but you can be in serious business right and that so, silliness so, somehow so connects what, us so what did you want to do with your first idea we didn't care about the idea at all right it was more of the actual what the realization was we just wanted to learn how to build a good product company like one of the lines that continue to stick with in our mind from joel one of joel spolsky's blog was the job of a founder is to get chairs out of the way so smart people can come in and solve customer problems right so that's the idea of actually building a company that has certain characteristics which is you are building a tech company you celebrate developers you celebrate uh, certain things that are associated with tech and solve customer problem but it's basically comes down to that customer obsession and just solving learning about breaking down a customer problem and then just using technology to solve it and that is what we actually wanted to do we realized that that is what we wanted to do and picking the idea is a means to an that end right so once we realized that to some degree we didn't care about what idea we even wanted to work on so, uh, so to so start so if i could contrast this is there are two i mean if one were to view this as a spectrum on one side you have some founders who come up with a very sharp insight like for example to use um, something that comes to the top of my head travis kalanick saying it would be great to have a cap come to you when you want and then everything else follows from there and he builds the organization and of yeah. course uber comes out of that hey, can and I, you're saying yeah. you want to build an organization which is great and does like you know and the idea for what that organization does which eventually becomes charge hmm. b comes later correct right but sometimes i also question the skeptic in me questions like it's actually a story that people also come up with after the company is successful Absolutely. or to make the company successful right but ultimately you still have to think about building an but organization but i would argue that <laughs> there is no chance that travis kalanick ever in his head must have thought that i want to build a great organization and then the idea follows perhaps you wanted to be oh, a founder true. True, or a true. yeah you want to be a founder you yeah. want to make money right and the order of list of priorities you want financial independence you want to learn to build a company right anybody who says i want to change the world but i don't care about making the money is just very naive or like uh, are treating think are insulting our intelligence that's it right uh <laughs> what advice would you give people graduating around these times or young fo- uh, potential founders or developers based on how you see your own the first 10 years of your career okay. uh, passing out without a job uh, spending 10 years in large organization like TCS and Cognizant then like you know finally getting to start like you know how how do yeah. you view this with the benefit of hindsight mm. one thing i think if we have to give ourselves some credit in certain areas one is mm, we kept the dream alive without drawing boundaries through the limit not knowing sometimes not knowing your limitations constraints that you are like in a different part of the world or like you don't see many such examples of a thro- uh, thriving ecosystem any of that i think ignoring all that in some ways and just looking at like the dream and possibilities is a, a that naivety is very good preserving it i think has been super important right just dreaming uh, second is we did i did not fall into the trap or habit of actually spending more than i had to a large degree from like even in 2005 raman reinforced um, a conversation that we had as an email to a bunch of friends saying okay here is the plan to make sure that you have build your nest egg so you can actually start a company to a bunch of us classmates actually only the two of us ended up starting the company a couple of them actually ended up investing in the company because the pact we had as classmates was some of us was to say um like who are is actually available to start a company come and join the company start a company otherwise others need to put money right uh, that is like uh, some kind of a conversation and every few months we used to catch up so being very disciplined in saving our salary from the beginning has been super helpful like my second like i said i mentioned that like my first salary was 3500 rupees right and but the tcs one straight away was 17000 rupees within the first year for me that felt like and i had moved back from bangalore to chennai back home i didn't know how to actually spend that money and thankfully i could just save so much more and i pretty much all my requirements i built around first around saving so i have built the habit of 
signing off on all the savings like one third of my salary into systematic investment plan mutual pf the provident fund and everything else and only whatever i get is how i used to design my life or like plan my spend and it's not that i am a meticulous financial planner right i till date i have not planned or even declared my tax thing to save on the 1 1 and a half lakhs of uh, atc or whatever that government provides like for most of my years i've missed it even the basic tax planning and yet what helped was just not expanding your wants as needs has been a very helpful framework raman was also same way right my thankfully my other two other co-founders how how did they were they also your classmates no they i knew them through zoho connection like him uh, through raman he so kps our current co-founder and ceo was his tech mentor right and ram when raman was trying to quit um he was trying to convince him to stay at zoho or start the reverse them. happened the reverse happened and then tiago was uh, his roommate and uh, he had been staying with him for quite some time and um i knew him through that and uh, he He's knew that because man. we were just talking he was like okay it looks like the two of you are discussing all the time looks like you guys are starting up if you are starting up i mean that's it <laughs> it would be remiss to say that the role that fomo plays uh, in the early stages because you did say yeah. that one of the things for you was that what if raman decides to start something else Yeah. and then you don't want else, to be yeah. right exactly and you know you just mentioned another co-founders like you guys are doing something i want to be in, in. Yeah. right like you know but i it's one of the forcing functions that sometimes because like you said you got VCs. it sorry <laughs> same for vcs absolutely right <laughs> like you know i mean yeah you're yeah. right what, what is it that you think that the four co-founders like bring which is complementary um very so even though a lot of ways we are similar i think we are also very very different people meaning um i'll talk a little bit about my co-founders right so tiago is technical architect right and uh, every one of us through a 10 12 year journey generally have our own ups and downs in mojo how we actually latch on to things and in the scaling journey of company finding our own identity and all of that happens right and a very tech person still does not have any direct reports right and deliberately calls himself technical architect and that's it right doesn't want any other title kps um, cto used to be someone who used to like for 6 hours he can just zone out and then just code uh, very different caliber of that engineer where without headphone he can stare at you you keep talking and then he'll be looking at you blankly and after some time he will just wave in front of your face saying okay sorry i mean i'm not able to hear you because he's always still thinking about that stuff right so very different type of engineer uh, whereas raman interestingly raman and i are very similar in many ways where we are more people oriented we actually take a joy in developing people and we realize that through the journey we get a lot more joy unlocking and helping people unblocking people um more than our own role set in our own roles to say this is what i want to do what is your leadership style at charge b um just understanding the strengths of people and then figuring out how can they make an impact and get out of the way and unblock them is how i would define it to a large degree like it goes back to even the hiring principle that we all do right which is you hire for strength not for lack of apparent weakness just you look at spikes in people and see how can they actually bring those strengths and bring value you are never going to get somebody who is perfect in every single way for any role whichever level that you hire you don't get anybody who is perfect right none of us are so which means the same thing applies to talent right and many a times we end up in the name of giving feedback and all of that we end up focusing on the negatives of people rather than actually thinking are they playing to their strength and what they want to do right you can always in the fringes is where we expand our skills and capabilities but you should know what is your fringe and am i actually playing in my core capabilities and my strengths if you are actually using your if you are a right hand player and you are always trying to play left handed then it's also my job to help them see that why why do you want to torture yourself how, how do you do this i'm very <laughs> curious about how you do this at the hiring stage now one is to be able to identify someone else's strengths hmm. but for that person to be successful within your organization you also need to be able to place them into a role where they are able to use those strengths at least mm-hmm. like you know frequently because when that mismatch happens when someone's someone is in a role where their strengths mm-hmm. are not being utilized 
is when they start to get frustrated and the organization gets, starts to get frustrated as well. How do you ensure that right. such charge be? Right. Um, I'll, I'll go a little bit into some of my understanding of how I look at the, the, the hiring or any individual, right? There are skills, core skills, past experience, you have been mentored and so you have a core set of capabilities that you bring to the table, whether you are a finance person, um, like trained in Deloitte or ENY, then you have a certain rigor, a work ethic that you bring to the table. Great. There's also the team building, right? Just like a coach of a team, you have to think about um, how they fit within the team and what are the dynamics of my team and the personalities that actually works, gels together as a team, right? And where am I bringing this person in? Am I bringing in a person who's going to lead the existing group of people? Then I need to think about Okay, I have a promise and a contract with the, this group of people who already are there, who have taken this company to this point, but transparently telling these people that I'm actually going to hire above you. Then I have a reasonable obligation to bring in a change maker. The reason you bring in somebody above many a times is also to acknowledge that, okay, we need some changes. I am no longer capable of actually guiding them to lead the, this particular group to the next level. And I want a coach, right? Somebody who has been there, done that, or brings certain capabilities that are unique, that is missing in the organization. And yet you want to bring something where the team dynamics plays a particular role in terms of, okay, uh, how do you actually hire the new leader in a way that it's a fit, right? That is one. If it is an individual contributor, again, um, let me think about the, the product. Let's just take a particular example. Maybe it will help. If I'm hiring a product manager, right? Um, the thing to look for is if I'm hiring a product manager for a zero to one initiative, I beyond the skills of being a product manager, thing to a look zero for zero to is one initiative being something which is very nascent, completely and nascent. Uh, first lot principles, of you have to talk chaos. to users. Not, there is nothing defined, right? You are you have a hunch that like entitlements is a product we released, right? Entitlements is an extension of what is a user entitled to. Like you have pricing and features on the website, almost a product or a service you have that or a media company you have it, but where do you write your entitlements? It goes into application code. Do you consider that part of your pricing? Do you consider that part of your billing? No. But somewhere it lives inside your organization's code and you don't have any flexibility to be able to test, expand, and all of that. Like I have a hunch that, like we had this hunch three years back that by studying customers, that you have a lot more opportunity to unbundle and rebundle your products and unlock value. Now, to go back to the example about huh. entitlement. So, entitlement, we considered it as a zero to one initiative three years back, right? And if I have to bring in, if I, and then, so that is one type of capability to build. Then there is a capability like uh, invoicing and taxes. Many would consider it boring, but it's extremely detail oriented and there is a lot more to do. It takes a particular type of personality and a person who enjoys, it's like, do you love solving that kind of a Lego blocks, like putting those together and then enjoy that process? It takes a certain personality of a person to extract, get joy from solving a very detail oriented problem that, and doesn't care about whether, whether some others consider it sexy and all of that. But for them, they get a lot of joy and pride in like solving it that way, right? And a very good organizer is what you are looking for versus for the entitlement, I need someone with characteristics who have demonstrated like early on their learnings should come from, uh, so the product manager we ended up hiring was someone who talked to a lot of users, somebody who actually um, built and probably sometimes failed like having successful products, and is okay sometimes successful that. products. And that kind of a person is probably best suited to take a one-liner definition and then imagine what it could look like and then give it life vision and, and such a person would, would never again, enjoy like, the other example that exactly gave, that person where? i cannot inspire them no matter how important it is i cannot like it even financial incentives won't make that person fall in love with building the invoicing and taxes probably unless they want it at a different stage in their career i'm sure you came to this realization later on in charge B's journey because there must have been a time when Chargebee hired. was growing <laughs> where you thought that any reasonably smart person could be called upon to do because it is also the founder mentality right as founders there is nothing that you wouldn't hold yourself back from at some point you're like there's a problem uh, no, I'll this do is it. one area this is this part that goes to the strengths and complementary aspects of us as founders as team we Did somehow that become clear yeah for us, yeah even though we wouldn't be able to define it or explain it this way 
we were able to talk about some of these things like certain things that we did early on were really good like deep brief conversations before hiring even though it was all informal like this we used to actually talk about it like one of the uh, the best marketers in the team for us in the very early hire she stayed with us like 4 5 years was we hired her out of she wanted a job um, from she was a tcs for one year and then was bored and came through a referral when we tried to hire her the only position that was available was for technical writing and then documentation she said yes to get in she said yes and then came into the company and then within like few months she was like she didn't like it at all and she came to us saying okay i wanted to get into the company but i don't like this at all but then we realized that mm, the problem she was also not happy with that work was somebody did not frame it as an inspirational work so actually kps is an amazing mentor for people early on in their career he enjoys that very early on uh, people to work with very people early in their career so he actually worked with her spent several hours every day working with her and she started enjoying it and then we realized that okay now there is a way in which once people understand the importance that actually for us api and ap documentation even product documentation is product it's not the ui and other things that you treat as product your documentation should be treated as first class citizen and a product that level of obsession if it is there with the founder cto why is that any less of an work uh, less of a work and then she actually fell in love with it but she became someone who was very good at then support then it became a transferable thing for her then she became one of the she is one of those creative people who actually did amazing level as a marketer later so i realized that there are there is this whole aspect of one core strengths and then certain things where you you will yourself to, you understand the importance of something people and apply themselves and do extremely well some of this happens um, i want to take you back to something that you mentioned at least twice in our conversation which is move the chairs get out of the way hmm of good people right so what does that really mean when you say get out of the way how does that translate into what you do as a leader mm. trust that one is uh, trust them to solve the problem but before that there is one crucial step right which is have they understood one the significance of what we are actually trying to solve are they acknowledging the problem current state as it is or are we in denial and as long as we are actually on the same page with respect see ultimately in no, any sorry i'm i'm still going yeah. to ask what does get out of the way mean <laughs> get out of the way means because it's trust them to yeah. solve the problem right and then you but why then you, you check way? in right so why are you in the way so delegation without review is abdication right so you delegate you trust them to solve the problem but you if you are responsible and ultimately if you are still responsible for that area then you still have to check in with them uh, for progress and hold them uh, have that conversation to ensure that it's actually progressing the way you would like right so that is general working style and within that uh, to be able to do this get out of the way what is one more important step that is there is to ensure that they have understood we are on the same page with respect to the problem definition the current state of things that we are asking them to fix or okay, what can i can i flip this question sure. what does being in the way look like uh being in the way look like you you since you're a, saying uh, yeah, yeah, getting yeah, out of the way yeah, yeah, yeah so you give the problem to them right and then you continue to obsess about it for me right being in the way would mean i say when i work on entitlements so here is what you need to do and then instead of actually trusting this person just agreeing on some contracts to say hey just make sure that you talk to these these types of people and build enough context come back to me with your learnings and then do xyz things and then just run with it i keep doing most of the user study and then go and tell micro him what to, micromanaging to some like yeah micromanaging is over simplified word but basically even simple things like telling him insights instead of trusting his learnings from customers i still continue to trust my hunch more than the information that he is actually is gathering first time is that not a very time. hard thing for a founder to let go of did you find it easy to let go of this um if you are going to trust somebody to solve the problem right one is uh, do they have the skills and why did you actually trust them with so you trust your own decision process of why you are interesting something with somebody and then allow them to do the job by not mm, overriding them through your hunches that i think and, is more important than micromanaging right we we call it review review is important right micromanaging does not mean don't do reviews right review is continuous check in enable them 
unblock them to win distant process. For example, there is a new product that we have been building. Um, one of the things like my 20 minute chat with the uh, three member team that's actually building is, um, okay, what do you guys need? Where are you? Like we have early four customers in the pipeline. One is already live, super exciting stuff. But how do I get 10, 20 customers is a question they are running with. I could actually tell them that, okay, take our freemium product. We already have $250,000 freemium that we offer to our early stage customer. Make it a million dollars and offer this to early adopters of this product and tell them that I'm actually going to bring more value to you. Why don't you become, why don't you talk to us and explore this new product? Ask for 15 minutes through that. I can actually make that kind of a decision by giving them the tools to succeed and I'm able to help them kind of with that decision, probably they will not be able to make themselves. That is unblocking. If I were to go tell them, oh, those four customers, they are all early stage startups. Why don't you actually start talking to some of these big customers who also look like they are talking about this problem? That I think is getting in the way because then I am actually letting my instincts overrule their actual scientific method of... You are leading them instead of letting them lead. Huh, letting them lead that, right? Because they are the DRI. They are the directly responsible individual for the success and failure of that thing. And allowing them to own is the in the best interest of the company and those individuals. So they can actually continue to own it and succeed or fail. That's okay, right? Um, but it's important that it's their thing rather than uh, making the decision then you hold them responsible is the worst thing to do. Got it. Krish, what's Chargebee's culture, if you're defined it very simply? Okay. <laughs> um, if I try to define it through the documented values in some ways, right? You sound is... kind of skeptical about <laughs> that. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, you deliberate. tell me that uh, very... the values came up roughly about, what, seven years seven after? Seven years into the journey, because we, as, see, we, we did not feel like... Um, writing down what we would consider as values, but because some things have to organically come together, right? The way we work and then distilling it is much better. Uh, I, I don't think we even planned for it. It's just that we never had rec um, this need to actually document this because you end up always, we all end up accumulating the kind of friends just the way we actually accumulate your colleagues. You pick people that you like working with for a reason, right? And then some people will reject you um, and move on. Uh, or you move on, uh, one of these two things happen. And ultimately that tribe of people becomes, that early tribe ends up attracting more of similar uh, people and uh, there are certain things that you cherish, right? It's not like, it's not and, a monoculture and yet... And rejecting some people as well, because like you yeah, said... Yeah, the system rejects. The system rejects people, right? As a, uh, as can all I group ask of you, people. Can I ask you what kind of people does the charge B system reject? And by that, I don't obviously mean like formally reject. Yeah, not, yeah, not everybody who leaves is necessarily rejected. But no, at the no, same I'm, time, I'm huh, not talking about who correct. will, what are the kind of people, people who will not succeed will at charge B? Who will not fit in. People who expect strict hierarchy, I don't think will succeed. The reason is, for example, somebody who is hierarchical in their behavior will also expect me to be hierarchical with them, right? As founder and CEO, because if I actually make decisions, they expect me, they, they will also look up to say, have you made a decision? Have you made up the mind? What do you want becomes a question. Then what I want becomes a mandate. And that's what they actually want to implement to please me or, or to align with me. Right. I agree. I don't think that works well for us because, yes, I'm a CEO. I'm the CEO responsible for certain things. But the way we actually work is more like peers, like my direct reports. I want to work with them more as peers. The reason why we have continuously upgraded and brought in change makers and senior leaders into the organization is because I have never been walked that path and that journey and I'm not a specialist in each of those areas. So I have a group of people and people who can counsel me with different perspectives where 80-90% of the decisions they are going to make. But the 10% of the decisions that needs a debate and probably alignment, they should be able to bring up those perspectives and we, I maybe if it is hunch driven decision, maybe like wherever there's data, decision is clear, wherever there is a hunch or like somebody has to be a uh, deal breaker, then I make the decision. I think stylistically that works well for us rather than someone who expects most of the decision to be hierarchical. Got decisions. it. Hierarchy is one. What are some of the other things that... Somebody who's uh, close, like the growth mindset is not there. Like hey, it sounds actually cliche to even say that for me because I don't know, almost everybody wants to say that, right? And will say that. But for us, if that... 
see if there is a skepticism cynicism is there about like for example um all hands if you take the case of all hands um it's very hard to make depending on the context in which uh, uh, some people have past experiences and different the companies hands, and all of that the all hands is all, your all hands for meetings, context is the uh, yeah. weekly weekly or monthly all hands meetings you bring that you have with your organization depending on your previous experience the relationship between you as a employee and your employer many a times is also colored right i don't judge people based on that but i just believe that so there is some level of dissonance or like distance that people sometimes maintain depending on the relationship and past experiences people have had that employer is out here to screw my happiness or like there is something that they are going to what is a catch right is always there there are uh, and i'm completely okay where people are skeptical and coming in because you don't hire um, thinking everybody has to like sing your praises and then like be a fan and all of that no right Uh, I'm completely comfortable with a mutual contract that is honored and respected, and uh, you bring your honest work and skills to the table, and we do the like we create value for you and all of that stuff. But what doesn't work for me is continuing to hold on to that cynicism and not ever be able to let your guard down to understand who we are is a lack of curiosity. Then you are letting your past dictate your future. That doesn't work well. right which is because my na- by nature right thankfully uh, i am somebody who is very comfortable showing vulnerability like and uh, within the company we are to a large degree very transparent and even things that we are not transparent about we tell them that sorry i'm not going to actually tell you if you are going through like for example several fundraisers that we have done in the past um i i used to go tell the team like sometimes even before announcing one week or before, there was one instance one month ahead of actual announcement we told the entire organization but we trusted everybody to keep it quiet to get the most because there are lots of impact. things that like can there go are wrong a lot of things that can go wrong but still money in the bank is in the bank i tell them that till the money is in the bank i'm not going to tell you and i don't want a distraction because we are not dependent on raising that last round of funding to keep running the company with or without that we can do that and yet if something goes falls apart and we don't close the round because somebody is asking for let's say a governance structure with some control as a last round of financier we don't want to give that we want clean governance so which means the deal might fall apart every for everybody else might it feel like a failure and then the morale can go down that is something we don't want to inflict on everybody right so there was nothing that had changed between the previous before the money came in or the money did not come in um and yet it can feel like a failure so we are not going to distract the organization my job is also to ensure that we are focused on what is important which is serving the customers building the product those are actually more important so i'm not going to distract the organization so these are things i will not tell you transparently and God, there God, are sorry things... i have a question here yes uh, since you mentioned like you know we are not dependent on money to uh, continue forward are you profitable uh, we are not but at any point in time thankfully um while building this company we have been very fortunate not to put ourselves in a situation where like the next round of funding has there ever happened done. in charge bees history that you've got your backs to the wall and the money is run out yeah we, there have been instances very early on in the journey there have been those one or two of those times and yet there were back pocket uh, like we were very close to profitability like one month or one within one or two months away from profitability uh, um at one point and then but we were also running out of money right but our existing investors said don't worry about it i got your back i can actually write a 5 million dollar check additionally and then you guys can just keep building it profitably so don't worry about it um but this could be a very interesting and strategic investor so let's try and close the round so we about the round actually like got delayed and then the whole negotiation like the closing of the contract took longer um and we were like almost on the were just actually not having enough in the bank to be able to meet payroll if the money funding doesn't close within the next 2 3 months again one of those instances when i did not tell the team about the risk but at the same time my job is to de-risk and build the plan b and had that in the back pocket but did not thankfully did not come down to executing the plan b and we were able to pull it off um so these sometimes like then that's the difference between extreme transparency and distracting the organization versus like the right level of transparency that is needed where the team trusts that i will tell them most things 
Mm, that is absolutely important, right, Don? What are some of the most common first principles or mental models you use for your decision making? Okay. Um, see, I'm not a very structured person to actually be able to say, okay, now these are the ones that I actually use, but you collect like pebbles all, all along and then you use them like along the way. Mm. So when it comes to cert, um, the the key decisions, right, which is the mm. the most important decisions versus the the decisions that you can actually like the one way door versus two way door kind of decisions that framework is super helpful right allow people to actually make decision get out of the way right it goes back to that for me because if it is actually a two way door decision it doesn't have to like don't expect others like learn to continues use it as a coaching opportunity to ask people what is the decision that you recommend and allow them to make the decision whether it's right or wrong because just make them recognize that it's a two way decision two door decision and then don't worry about overthinking it don't ask for permission because you are now continuously pushing your decision up asking somebody else to make it use it as a coaching opportunity to allow people to make those decisions so recognizing patterns of decisions is actually a very good coaching opportunity um so that way i try to make sure that i don't make as many decisions as possible um when it comes to um, in in yeah. some ways to a lot of people it would seem counterintuitive that you're the ceo of charge b and you're saying that i try to not make decisions myself right and what you essentially saying is because you want uh someone else to be able to grow into the ability to make those decisions correct right and, and this is a this is a very important it's it's like a chicken and egg kind of situation until and unless <laughs> founders stop making decisions employees yeah. will not make decisions yeah. and sometimes founders don't stop making decisions because they are not seeing the employees make those decisions right so how yeah. how did you kind I of think how do you like solve this like it comes down to mostly like parenting right you learn to teach others to make the decision if you want the organization to do well long term uh you hope that the distribution of decision making whether it's a hiring decision you want the panel to be able to make better decisions better judgment in hiring good people how do you do that it comes down to a couple of things which is learning to teach people how to actually make the decision which is one you break it let's take the example of hiring you can keep telling people okay these are value system this is how we hire and all of that but if you want to democratize this whole process where everybody learns to hire well it comes down to okay basic tooling of the hiring process which is okay jd is past experience like our your future requirement like what is the job to be done but your scorecard writing down a scorecard a stack rank list of priorities of what you are going to look in that person that is nothing to do with hiring the future definition of the job but what do you want to look for in the past right and what are the skills that you want to stack rank and look at so rigor of writing a jd then defining your hiring panel before even going into the interview and then knowing who is the hiring manager having that clarity defining it declaring that and then say okay now you are the person who is going to responsibly hire well and debrief right ensuring that there is a there is a hell yes from everybody super excitement easy decisions to make that is easy rejecting is easy but it's a borderline where we tend to make mistakes so which means knowing when to do debrief calls where it's 15 minutes everybody talks about like two three options of candidates and pacing two three candidates together so that you actually have a choice like rather than taking like one person that looks more interesting and then not even looking at other interesting candidates little things in the process actually comes together where organization learns to make good hiring decisions now there are times when we all think okay we are not amazon and then there will always be a voice to say we are not that big we should just like hire and then there are moments when you actually realize that no this is one of those most important decisions so i'm going to put more rigor into it and here is how we are going to break down and hire well so you can um teach people how to actually hire well sorry we, how how did we actually end up on the hiring conversation sorry <laughs> no no that's all right like um, um we were talking about um decision making and, yeah i mean ah, i was okay, asking teaching, you first uh, like principles the, the, the also yeah. and the parenting so, yeah so ha 
So this is one part, right? Which is you can teach a bunch of these skill based breaking down of a job of hiring into a method and a process, just like Amazon has done, right? Um, and all of those. But then there's a second aspect of you don't want to like however it's tempting to think, okay, I am wanted in the company because everybody comes to you for a decision. I think there is, if we want uh, an organization to be something that will go beyond us, it's important that um, a lot of things will be done well without our involvement. And that means it comes down to almost like closely uh, related to parenting, which is uh, one thing that we try to teach our kids is learn to make good decisions, right? Recognizing good versus bad decision. If we can teach them that, our job is done to a large degree, right? It It's almost very similar inside organization. You're a parent where, to two Two boys. boys, two boys, 13 and nine year old. Uh, um, so it it almost feels very similar in a way that you don't want the dependency. That if only if I am involved, then things are done well. If I'm not involved, things could be worse. Means I've not done my job well in setting up the organization right. Right. My job is to get out of the way where people are already making good decisions and this is a good company and everybody enjoys working with each other, whether I'm present or not, right? So continuously firing ourselves from the job is the most important job. But focusing on those, that rigor, rituals and habits of the organization in a way that there's a method. I think this is how I deconstruct the way I see Amazon values that the whole famous things that they have done, like the empty user chair and all of those, like great stories. I don't know, like some, they like obsess about and practice. But in some ways, you have massive respect for the way they are able to take what is working in one region. And if they set up a Chennai center, they exactly take what is working in Seattle and then they are able to replicate it in a Chennai following those rituals. That's where you realize that that's a fantastic tool. What are some of the rituals uh, that are important at Charge B? Hmm. Um, we spoke about the values part, right? So... We said we'll define it only as operating principle after some time. But while trying to do it, we realized, uh, we asked everybody, what are those things that we actually respect in each other, enjoy um, in each other and all of that. One of those things that um, serendipitously we did, and we have been doing it now for five, six years, is uh, every Friday we listen to podcast to reinforce the habit of learning. Um, not everybody is forced to come in and all of that, like pre-COVID, while in office, people used to even sit in the conference room, like in the floor, it used to be full house. Um, we used to have overflowing conference room where people would sit and listen to just podcast for 30, 40 minutes, and then would debate for like 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes it goes longer and we will talk about different topics. It, it used to be about like mental models, um, decision making process and um, biases and product management, design thinking and our founder stories, everything. And, and we used to have like even external speak like founders are like people who have thought about a particular topic to come and listen with us and then they would actually talk about it we have done all of those things um but every friday this is something that we follow as a ritual but one thing we realized was raman and i used to talk about it to say we cannot be cynics when it comes to this like and we have to lead from the front when it comes to just sitting there and being there to reinforce this as a habit right one is we credit a lot of our learning um to a large degree, you see, we, we don't look at ourselves as um, talented or like extremely gifted in any particular way uh, to actually be the founders of, um, how do you put it? A three and a half billion dollar ah, Whatever company. that is, right? <laughs> so, which is like, in, in some ways, right? What are we very good at? Which is like listening to customers, breaking down a problem and um, helping people actually solve problems is what we are good at. How did we end up actually building a company? Somehow we like picked up some skills along the way and we got lucky with picking a good problem where the market is actually huge. And then we also made a bunch of good decisions around it. We put ourselves in a situation where like continuously all of this snowballs, but it's something that all of us built together. That's it. Right. So before we move on from this point, what was the inflection point? Because you said earlier that the first five years you went round and round in circles. Yeah. Right. You didn't grow as fast. Now, obviously, you did something and you just explained that you did made a bunch of good decisions and like. Correct. When you look back at Charge B's history, what were the inflection points mm -hmm. and what enabled you to kind of uh, switch gears? OK, uh, the most important one, <laughs> I think uh, if I have to distill it down is 
the tech and the non-tech side of things, we used to operate as if like left hand and right hand, but doesn't know what each other is doing. But we just implicitly assume that it's supposed to know or knows. And then we used to just go down our own path to thinking, okay, I'm building a product and you take care of GTM and then let's do this. What we did not do GTM was being collaborate, go to market, the go to market, right? What we did not do really well was to seek each other's help to, um, to align and be in the same direction, like vectors. Instead, we were... When did this happen? Like, um, I think But again, what years, was yeah, the trigger for this? Lack of growth, meaning we realized, recognized that we are actually going in circles where the metrics that we want, where we are able to see the strong traction where the revenue is growing faster, right? Or any of those things were not happening at the pace we would like. Like we had hundreds of customers and then we were like, reasonable uh, revenue and all of those things. But even while trying to hit that first million, again and again, we were going in circles where the churn is high and then or something or other is somehow doesn't make sense. And we realized that, you know what, it feels like product market fit and all of that. But then somewhere it feels like if we, we started analyzing it, like engineers, we realized that, okay, something is wrong. Why don't we try and understand? That's when we started putting our heads together to look at our customer data and then said, okay, what is it we are actually doing wrong? and all of that. And we realized that why are we having so many diverse types of customers? And then said, okay, if we have to get from here to here, one to five in five quarters, what are we going to do? Or one to 10 in 10 quarters, what are we going to do? We realized that, okay, we could possibly to even get to one to five million, we could actually get more of similar customers, but there is going to be a, it's going to get harder and harder for you to get that uh, freemium plus the 2K, 4K customers, only so many of them, and then be able to get like hit that velocity. So which means now we have to sell bigger ticket size of new customers, which means you need a certain types of features. Then we learn to seek each other's help to say, okay, if I want to be say, able to sell a much bigger ASP, like 12K deals or 20K deals, I need certain capabilities that justifies the value and to be able to be relevant for certain types of customers. So I sought help from engineering to say, in six months, I want to be able to win more of these 12K, 20K deals can you build these capabilities to actually make it happen? Then we started engineering our growth together. It looks like this is a classical inflection point where the entire organization came together around exactly. some kind of a North Star goal Correct. or North metric. North Star goal of like growth, right? Which is what? why it feels really stupid not to internalize what Paul Graham calls us. If you're a startup, if you're not growing, you're dying. Default alive or default dead. <laughs> well, default alive, default dead. Yes, that is there, right? Which is um, like how much runway you have and mm -hmm. all of that to at least be able to sustain mm -hmm. and your cash flow. But the other one is if you are not growing as an organization continuously, like where uh, something you you need the North Star metric growing continuously. What was that? Like at this point, like, you know, the where you referenced just now, where after four or five years, you all came together and said, was there something specific that you said as a North Star metric or goal at that point? We anchored around our revenue and our customer's TPV, the total process volume. Mm -hmm. Our customer's aggregate revenue has to continuously grow. Or we were at 1.3 or something. We said, okay, we'll do 5.5. Try and put that. Over we, what time period? Over one year period. So we said, okay, how do you go on the trajectory? And then we actually did it in five quarters instead of four quarters, but it was much better at least to actually put a number there and then trying to hit it. And then we kept on doubling our number from that point. But just that orientation that it is possible, that being able to see those possibilities was like that switch that goes on your mind. And it changes everything about the, the trajectory of the company, right? The belief and how you want to build the organization, everything changes. Got it. We talked about mental models. You also mentioned one of the things um, in those meetings on Fridays, you said one of the things that you try to look for as an organization is biases. Are there any biases that you try to be conscious about as a leader uh, <laughs> during your, like for example, a sunk cost bias or anything else? Like, you know, are there biases that are you have, like mental, usually some of us yeah. have favorite mental models. Do you have favorite biases to watch <laughs> out for? More than bias, I would say, the desire to believe that, like my, for me, it's almost like a fear, right? Wanting to be right. How about, do you guard against that? Huh. Because you, because you think that- what For me, one of the is... breakthrough conversations. So I've been going through uh, uh, the founder coach, like between me and Raman, we had a founder coach for the last two and a half, three years, which has been super helpful uh, for my own learning 
through the journey of the organization um, to also let, learning to let go and then building a particular type of organization this has been very helpful one of my breakthrough conversations personally was um, this attachment to what is definition of success right um so a particular so this is conscious.is right but this is almost like most leadership coaching frameworks are very similar this has particular types of commitments and all of that but it comes down to same fundamentals the story you tell yourself and then being present and all of those things so one particular breakthrough conversation for me was about um, this thing where i was obsessing about uh, certain decision making of a particular person saying like why is this person doing this and i'm actually annoyed and uh, i should probably give this feedback but i'm worried what kind of impact it will have and i'm not sure if i am right but i don't like it and all of that stuff and um, it was a personal conversation with the coach and then he said okay let's back up a little bit let's talk about why do you think you are you could be right and that person could be wrong i said okay because i think this could be the right answer and all of that stuff and his question was why mm why do you think he should probably try your thing and he said okay i, I just want this outcome to be successful so i want it he said okay now can you define what why you want that to be successful i said why wouldn't i want this to be successful he said okay then talk, let's talk about charge b why do you think you are actually building the company right well, everything that you do he said okay i want charge b to be successful he said okay that's great but do you believe that charge b being what what is charge b being successful i said okay large company like if it has created value for everybody it continues to create value for everybody for customers and for the employees and everybody who's joining at every phase is finding value all of that i said okay that's all fair but why do you do you absolutely believe that charge b being successful like creating a lot more economic value like all of that is the only right answer why wouldn't i want it to be any other answer like yes of course like i'm doing this for like 10 11 years at that time i of course i want it he said okay that's great but can you just for the sake of this exercise write down charge b was a spectacular failure something happened wrong you got wiped out and yet everybody that you talk about think of had a phenomenally great outcome better than it is within the next 3 or 5 years can you imagine a scenario and start writing for me just like entertain me you know like okay then i said oh, i had to force myself to say okay charge b failed spectacularly everything is zero and then something like went completely wrong then i said okay but we have like more than 50 60 ex founders inside the company a lot of phenomenally talented people people who have learned like how to build things do things and then not what not to do and also like all of that and we have a set of learnings so maybe some 10 20 companies will get created because of this core group of people like all of these talented people might form like so many of that there is enough capital available in the ecosystem and we have we have a vantage point from which we see companies at various stages that all of us would have picked up different problems that we might want to solve maybe we are holding on to our current journey because we are doing this so i just wrote a story saying okay now 20 companies came out five 10 of them became phenomenally successful within five years we created so much more economic value for everybody and then 10 companies became like 1000 people company and then much bigger than charge we could have been all of that i said okay now do you realize that your scenario one that charge be being successful has not happened yet and like what you have is good but it's not this definition that you are talking about like in the future you want a particular type of success that has not happened and this one has also has not happened in both our stories in your residing in your head and you have a preference for the first one that doesn't mean that is the right answer that was a breakthrough conversation for me and then he said then learn to internalize it as a preference that is a game you want outcome you want for the game understand that it is still a game then play lightly with that preference don't hold on to every decision that it has to deliver that outcome but i say my preference is this should be a 20 30 bill 40 billion dollar company and if that actually north star orientation actually helps maybe you are creating all the economic value all kinds of successful outcome for everybody you play with that preference play lightly then it allows you to play with joy and a lot more creativity because you imagine yourself every time when do you make come up with best ideas when you are at your creative best is when you are playing lighter 
not when you are actually tense and all of that so tread lightly like hold on to these as preferences learn to treat no when certain things are preferences when some things are actually becoming too tight that you are being right or you want to be right the reason why we want to be right is you think that's the only right answer is when that happens and that was for me that was like a holy shit at kind of moment and then it has been very helpful in a lot of decisions after that right and um, yeah pretty much it applies it almost feels like common sense and then you realize that okay I should have learned all of this during school days but then you realize that okay it is uh, for me personally breakthrough conversation uh, to be able to operate with that level of lightness uh, and treat things as preferences when you see charge be now and what you're doing as a game how do you define that game ha huh. see there are different types every individual is different right so not every Broadly, single as a person cult- looks at, a at it as level. like work is not life and uh, absolutely uh, that is how it should be right every... to that point exactly what yeah, you just mentioned correct right and there is a certain like there is a wiring mm, man manu- i call it as manufacturing mistake with that we, some of us have where work becomes a large part of your life and definition like and that is okay and then there will be a lot of people who actually treat work as work as a 9 to 5 thing and that's okay right you need the mix of healthy mix of all kinds of people uh the game that i think everybody should play is that great work ethic you have a social contract with your relations that you have friends and all of that the same way you have a enter into a relationship a contract with your employer as an employee what is asked in return is that work ethic of the job job definition where you obsess about a customer and you can have internal customers or external customers but your job is to understand the needs of a customer solve the problems and then derive economic value from it is basically the game that we choose to play the intensity with which any person chooses to play or the lightness and that the lightness right um, that is completely different so you can still be in serious business like you can you uh what how do we say this right you um we can be in serious business but you still don't have to take yourself seriously the silliness right and creativity is necessary like like kid like enjoyment when it comes to approaching things is necessary so that lightness is necessary and yet you know that you are into the integrity of the contract is super important that work ethic and all of those things that's all that's expected right um like for example if you cannot work for let's say a couple of days this particular week or like this particular month you are having a personal situation where like you need to spend more time with your kid go talk to your manager and tell them that hey this particular month the three days that i'm four days i'm going to work i can actually do this or these core hours i can do a lot more these hours i actually i want to be able to prioritize this we are completely comfortable and i would appreciate people wanting to have those kind of conversation transfer and conversation and be able to establish that contract and i i would like the managers also to be empathetic right i would be very annoyed if managers actually don't understand this right their managers don't understand this but um like owning that is the part, very much part of the integral to the contract right that's a game that everybody sh- i would ideally like everybody to play i want to back it up a bit krish because i sense this i i think i have it you have it a lot of people have it as well which is essentially the hesitation to perhaps say that work can be enjoyable yes. and work can be fun and yeah. that work can be happy because i think we somehow as founders get defensive and say look it does not mean that you need to give your you know turn over your personal life to it yeah. but i look at it a very simple point of view if you are going to spend 8 hours of your day at you might work as well do it well. <laughs> might as well enjoy yeah. what you are doing might as well play it as a game Correct. right as opposed to and i think this is a relatively i think you know i mean over the last maybe like 3 4 years it's again coming up which is essentially it's a strict contract and i'm doing it because i'm paid a salary which is all right but as an individual if you're given an option where salaries are the same and in one workplace you get to enjoy and have fun and do things that you like and you're good at and in the other one it doesn't really matter which one would you rather pick right so it's a no brainer in some level for me and i do feel that that is fraying a bit where some of us especially the younger generation thinks that it's wrong to want to have fun at work 
or right. to be happy at work right it's a over simplistic one right the moment somebody says work is fun and all of that everybody it does not imply that, that, that i'm not asking uh, for like 80 hours or anything like that i'm exactly. just saying actually have fun right you can do it for even if you're a deferred life plan right but like the 10 years that i actually spent in all these companies or raman worked at zoho he never wrote his own cv uh, kps co-founder he never had a linkedin profile for 10 years right and he never had written his cv even once and seven years into charge was the first time we had to make him write a cv because we had to apply for his us visa right so there are people like that who actually had like we all had fun and i actually had a very enjoyable time in all the jobs but i also had a deferred life plan of actually planning to want to start up not actually having a time frame when but you can do both right uh, if like then my life did not have to be miserable or think that okay things suck at tcs or things suck at any of those companies for me to want to start up it was actually enjoyable and i gave it i feel like i gave it my all and that's how i learned whatever i was able to pick up in my job and that's the only way you can choose to do things in a way it's meaningful and with satisfaction when every time you look back how do you manage to see outside your own biases and bubbles especially as a founder ceo <laughs> you need somebody who will call your bluff <laughs> continuously and right i'm assuming somebody one show set of people <laughs> are your co-founders Correct. but other than that Do you I think have the, any the silliness actually helps build that relationship with all your peers as well, like peers, like, you know, co-workers and all, right? When we are actually deviating from some of these things that we have said, but jokingly, people should be able to point it out, point our own like deviations uh, or like slight changes. I think if that is there without heaviness of struggling to actually point it out, that's when it becomes a cult or a particular behavior where the, the, the like you form a hero, or your role um defines the the what is a hero worship kind of a behavior that nobody is able to point out flaws becomes a trap right and uh, one of the things is thankfully uh, one thing we consciously are trying to work on is how do we have that circle of people continuously in the organization not our in circle or anything but a lot more people are able to comfortably point out that okay hey did you notice that you actually did something different right and it could be right or like better any of those things but that's like conversation needs to happen to be able to point out things show the mirror and that's helpful right because none of us are trying to be perfect but it's just um just being able to operate as colleagues with mutual respect right if you are in the trenches and then you are working, working together why not have that mutual respect where we are working only as peers and colleagues um some of that doesn't have to reflect it's it's if somebody is able to point it out it's a credit to them um plus you earned one more person who actually is uh, you are able to comfort- get comfortable with what's the best way to give feedback to you hmm my wife would love to know the answer <laughs> best way to give feedback um mm. the best way the best time um actually the best way to give feedback is by um not wanting to control my situation right meaning the best way to okay now i'm telling the opposite how not to give feedback but the best way to give feedback is to ask hey can i tell you give me a feedback can I give you a feedback just seeking permission when i'm in the receptive mode immediately second is to just say here is my story or here is my observation i have nothing to dispute it was your observation i think that generally goes a long way where anybody can share anything and that is something we try to strongly encourage there have been instances when um, internally when somebody wanted to give a feedback to a cxo right and then they were actually feeling very miserable inside the organization and this is an individual contributor i remember a particular instance where i was able to draw up on my lesson from conscious leadership to go to coach play the coach role to tell them actually you know what i can go give the feedback i realized this happened and i learned about it but you are that that person was trying to quit and i said okay why do you want to quit and all of that and then this person was extremely frustrated with the way they were treated and then felt miserable or like and um um felt insulted right and i said okay you can choose to quit do you actually not like working in this company the person is actually absolutely loved working in the company which is why like i the information surfaced to me during exit interview that's how i reached out and said okay if you want to quit absolutely quit but would you be able to say you are walking away without any regrets or will you actually think i wish i was able to say this and still quit if nothing changed 
then uh, the person said actually you know what you are right i wish i could actually say this but i don't know because i'm scared uh, hierarchy and all of that i said but you are quitting if you imagine that your career will not be jeopardized in any way and i will actually you can use me as a reference and i will personally vouch and make sure that you are able to land anywhere that you want to go then you can remove the fear of actually this career being um, colored because of this relationship but would you still want to give the feedback so you can actually move on without regrets the person said yes and i said let me help you frame the feedback it will also help the person you will also realize that maybe the person did not even realize that they created a situation like this it was a breakthrough moment for the person when they wrote down the feedback saying this is how i felt this is this happened these were the facts during this conversation you did not let me talk and then you overrode everything that i said and then you went on a rant for the next next five and minutes which had nothing to do with the things that i did here is my feeling here is my story because of all of this i even came to a decision where i am not valued and i was actually thinking about leaving moving on from the organization and this is not how i actually thought charge b will actually work and i actually love the company i love working with my peer group yet this particular conversation led me to this kind of decision and i asked this person to give that feedback directly to the cxo instead of even me relaying it and i said don't copy me don't even tell this person that i know about this surprisingly the person picked up the cxo picked up the phone asked for a call talk to them and apologize and they realized that both of them had the right intent right place in the heart and the person said okay i shouldn't have reacted this way and the cxo apologized and something changed and then the person came back saying i didn't like for me i feel lighter because i could give feedback to a cxo and come out of the conversation more positive i don't want to quit i would rather be in a company that allows me to be able to give feedback to anybody so i would stay and the person continues to stay and do well right so um uh, why did we go into this uh, tangent uh, i think mostly it comes down to how to give feedback right i think for me learning to give feedback or receive feedback again um over time we all pick up different ways in which we all work but i think even being able to play the coach opportunity to actually teach somebody else like ignoring the power structure but treat somebody else as a peer regardless of the title to actually be able to do that was a breakthrough moment for me also to like be able to like coach somebody to give feedback <laughs> thank you so much for your time krish oh thank you this was fun <laughs>